My name is Malcolm Knox. Uh, I'm here with Deborah Robertson and uh, we'll introduce each other uh, before we get started. Um, I feel honoured to introduce Deborah to you because I'm kind of here as a fan um, as much as a, as a colleague. Uh, Deborah, you probably know, is already the author of the short story collection Proud Flesh and the fantastic novel from a few years ago, Careless. Um, her new novel, Sweet Old World, for those of you who, who haven't read Deborah, um, you're really in for a, a privilege. And for those of you who have read her before and um, are coming back to her, you'll see in this book she's gone to a new, a new level altogether. She's a fantastic, um, fantastically skilled expert novelist. Uh, the book, to summarise, um, is uh, told through the eyes of a man, David, who's a, who's a burnt-out uh, journalist uh, in his middle years who's gone to uh, uh, the Aran Islands off, off Ireland uh, where his sister is running a guest house with um, varying levels of competence. Um, he's writing a book, but essentially he's, he's trying to grab at a last chance uh, and in, in some ways question what's gone wrong with his life but uh, he's, still, he's still in a large part of himself a young man who has an intimation of a future. Um, he, he meets a young woman, an Australian woman who's travelling uh, called Etty and has quite a, a significant um, uh, encounter with her um, but she has a, a, an accident which brings into his life her mother, Tanya, and this is the essence of the love story um, that is Sweet Old World. Um, Tanya, th there's a beautiful phrase Deborah uses, which is how, how Tanya gentles everything uh, for David, and it's not, it's not just that she gentles the present, but she gentles his past as well, and he begins to... Uh, read his past differently due to her influence. Um, he is a man who is willing himself to redeem uh, for, for redemption, for personal redemption, and to almost backfill his life emotionally, to, to go through and find his emotional failings and, and do something about them now and do something about them uh, for his future. Um, but of course... He's also struggling against his own nature, which gets in his own way, and um, uh, and struggling to a degree with, with Tanya's nature as a woman. So um, that that tells you a little bit about why why Deborah is here talking about about manhood. Um, but really, this is a fantastic novel, and um, to, to talk about manhood is to slice a little bit off a novel that is an absolute. Um, complete reading experience, an experience that will leave you feeling that you have uh, in those pages lived another life told by uh, a wonderful storyteller. So please welcome Deborah Robertson. Thank you, Malcolm. That was such a generous way to be introduced. Um, uh, Sweet Old World came out yesterday, so it's still a very um, raw and new experience speaking about this for me. But I want to introduce Malcolm's book, um, The Life. The Life is Malcolm's fourth novel. And um, it too, I think, is um, about a man struggling to account for his past and really to put together some sort of plans and hopes for a future. The, the man that we spend time with in the pages of The Life is Dennis Keith, who's a 58-year-old ex-pro champion, mythic uh, hero surfer, and um, of the kind that only perhaps surfing culture can, can throw up. Um, he's, but he's now washed up, he's um, overweight, he's suffering from um, some mental distress, um, he's got a very, very bad diet, he's living um, at home with his mum who's uh, living in a retirement village in Koolangatta, which is where he, the, most of the novel is set. Um, and Dennis, Dennis um, 
Dennis seems t- is a man who, for me anyway, is struggling with the loss of physicality in his life. Um, th- this is a novel that practically breaks apart with the energy of its character's voice and um, physical momentum. Um, the the passages are about um, boyhood and the physicality of boyhood. Um, I've never read anything quite like it. And that physicality is extended into Dennis Keith, Keith's um, championship surfing years. But then when those surfing years are over, we have a man who who's, um, in a sense, his manhood has been utterly invested in his body and the competition um, with his body and with other male bodies. And he is suddenly stranded almost as a child within a maturing man's body. And the novel, for me, at some levels, but certainly not at all levels, is about that. So I suppose the Adelaide Festival has brought Malcolm and me here today because... I guess we, our, our novels seem to be in agreement that um, there is such a thing as the man question, just as several decades ago there was such a thing as the woman question. And I suppose the implication in that is, um, is there something we can do to solve the problem of masculinity? And I guess my first question would be to Malcolm. Um, is that a reasonable question to ask. Is it reasonable to pose masculinity as a problem, Malcolm? (laughs) Never been a problem for me. (laughs) (laughs) Or me, I have to say. (laughs) Um, Yeah, well, I... I'm not quite conscious of writing as a man, you know, until until the book meets a reader. And um, you've just done it for me again. Readers always bring the meaning of your work to you. You're, you're often you're often just writing as yourself and and to a degree for yourself. Um, I sort of feel that uh, because I come, I come from a kind of a manly background. Um, I, I was one of two boys. We went to an all boys school. All of our relatives seemed to be boys. Um, my mum was really into boys sports, into sports in general. Uh, her, her father, my grandfather, was a great influence on her life. He was a, you know, a, a terrific, um, a terrific guy. Uh, it, it was a big. There was a big problem emerging at the age of 18 or 19 from school and never having met a girl. Um, and that was my problem of masculinity. I, you know, I didn't know how to talk to a girl. Uh, but is there a question? I don't know. I, I hope there is a question for some people. Uh, I remember um, a, a colleague, a work colleague of mine, uh, a woman who um, I, I showed her a copy of a book by David Foster Wallace, mm. who I know you read, he gets a mention in, in Sweet Old World. And the book it was titled Brief Interviews with Hideous Men. Mm. And uh, yeah. I, I flashed it at her and I said, this is great. And she looked at it and she said, oh, I've had enough of hideous men. <laughs> <laughs> and, and walked off. And, and you know, I guess, I guess there are readers who have had enough of hideous men and have had enough of men in general and who've, who've closed, closed the door on men. But... Um, I also think there are both among male readers and, and female readers that um, um, there's there is a question and and there is a sense of change uh, mm. happening and things things that we say now about about men are not things that we could have said mm. uh, twenty or thirty years ago and and for that for that alone yes there is a question that's alive but you know I'm because because I'm um, I've never really called myself a man before, but I suppose I am. Um, uh, I, I always feel that I'm bringing the news. I'm bringing the news to a largely female readership, and my first readers uh, are, are all women, yeah. and, and they're all women who are not interested in the things, you know, like surfing in this book um, that, that interest me. So I've got to, I've got to carry the news across a kind of a, a raging. Um, uh, river and, and get it to the other side and, and translate something of, mm-hmm. of my experience which which happens with, through these characters to be a, a male experience. Um, um, 
it, it's it's not often that something that's often thought about um, when we talk about Germaine Greer's The Female Eunuch, but in the introduction to that novel, she states so clearly um, that n no one will be free until men are free. And I think we've had so many decades of... Um, uh, of the Freedom Project for Women, um, and yet the, r the range of expression for men is still, I think, very narrow, and I think that that's, it's so obvious in both Malcolm and my books that, that that's something that we're really sort of pushing against and, and w frustrated by. Well, our characters are anyway. Um, I did tell this little story yesterday at my book launch, so I'm, I hope um, I won't be, sound too repetitive, but I do want to say this, um, I, while I was writing Sweet Old World, I came across a series of really remarkable photographs that goes so uh, much to the heart of what we're talking about today, I think. They're photographs by a young American photographer, photographer called Suzanne Upton, and she was asked to take a series of portraits of uh, US soldiers on leave <coughs> from Iraq. <coughs> so these men were... Um, They'd been in the theatre of war. They'd seen things they would perhaps um, never forget. They were tired. Um, and um, she, she wanted to somehow get into their sort of masculinity in a way that um, showed something new, as, as simple as that. So what she decided to do, she was just asked to take head and shoulder photographs. She, she did something so simple and so clever instead of taking photos of the men sitting or standing, she asked them to lie on their side and the, their, their sideways views of these men. So they would be the views that you would have if you were lying next to these men on a pillow or perhaps if you were looking at a sleeping child. And all of the, the social uniform almost the way that the body is. Um, I mean, both for women and for men, when we stand up, we present a kind of gendered body. But when we're lying down, we're sort of closer to our animal selves, I think. And these photographs allow a vulnerability um, and a relaxation into the view of these men that she you wouldn't have got from taking another view. And, and I think that this is what no, we try to do as novelists, whether, yeah. whether they're men or women. We just try to take an angle of dive that gets beyond the rigid constraints of social ways of seeing. Well, there's, there's a passage in, in Sweet Old World, in Deborah's novel, that, that I think um, uh, you know, grabs this and, and, and as fine writing does, puts it in a nutshell. And um, it comes through um, a, a, a visit to the island by some Elvis impersonators. And um, David, our, our um, protagonist, um, has a moment of insight through, uh, through meeting the Elvises wandering around. And, and it's beautifully put. He, he, he thinks, the passage says, like Elvis, he's been confused about what the world wants from him, puzzled by his strengths as much as his weaknesses. He too has abused love, misunderstood reality. He's been gnawed at by hungers, distracted himself with trinkets, gone missing in his own flesh. And to me, it, it was just, yes, that's, that's it. And, and, and that's really the answer to your question of, is there a question um, mm. a, about manhood? Where was it that men did start to go missing in their own flesh? Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know that I can come up with an answer, but um, I, I, I think men do go missing in their, their own flesh, and um, oh, I think women do too. Um, but uh, I, I don't know. I, I can't, I can't answer that question. We started, Deborah and I started um, corresponding via email about our session today a couple of weeks ago, and in the subject line of Deborah's first email, to me the subject line was manhood. And in her um, email she said, well, I bet you don't get that in the subject line of your emails very often. In fact, to the contrary, um, if, if, if you have a male name, uh, your spam folder is full of um, <laughs> emails uh, inciting you to enlarge your manhood. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's obviously, you know, for myself, I, I don't need uh, to think about these matters, but um, uh, 
is this a kind of a, a, a metaphor for, for male anxiety that um, th their manhood or their, their idea of, um, of themselves, which used to be certain, apparently, mm -hmm. is now uncertain and, and it's, 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 it's suffering shrinkage. And, um, you know, you wouldn't even think it needed enlarging uh, unless you're being told all the time that, that it's shrinking and it needs enlarging. I'm wondering, as a, as a woman, because you don't, you don't suffer from this, uh, this email uh, incursion, um, are you at, a, at an advantage somehow looking into the male condition? Uh, oh, my goodness. I've never felt um, advantaged around men in, in any respect whatsoever. Um, I'm glad I'm not a man. I don't know if that's an advantage. Um, uh, again, I'm a, a bit of a loss. At that I, I was just I was just thinking of something that I wanted to say though in terms of this um, idea of anxiety around the male body. I think. It is very, very interesting to um, look at what's happening in um, the culture of young men at the moment with um, the bodybuilding phen phenomenon um, and the, um, what seems to be an almost epidemic use of steroids, um, uh, uh, increased rates of anorexia and bulimia in young men. Um, cases even of ma men dying quite young from um, ex excessive training and steroid use, and this is a this is a control of the male body that sounds uh, is is much much closer to my experience of living in a female body, which is you know being controlled since I be, was an adolescent really, and I wonder. Um, I wonder whether there's this sort of lack, there's a lack of ritual for masculinity in culture anymore. Um, I mean, we have sport, but sport is perhaps not enough um, for for some men. There is a there there seems to be um, almost the need for the expression of a certain kind of extremity, which also, you know gets expressed in various sort of masculine theatres like war and. Um, that is being taken up by the, the cult of, of bodybuilding. Yeah, well, physical culture, physical culture has been so transformed in Australia in, in the last even 10 years, a really short period of time, um, from, from a club and community culture uh, yeah. into, to, into a, um, a, a granulated... Uh, individual physical culture, and you see, if you look at the stats on um, Australians with with uh, sport and uh, and physical activity, participation is going up, but it's going up in uh, things like gym, bodybuilding, uh, oh. surfing, um, yeah. extreme sports, skateboarding, and it's really dropping in team sports, and and that's not only um, an interesting um, uh, revelation about the way. Um, g girls and boys mm. are seeing themselves, but the, the the club, the club background of team sports um, certainly when when I was young and when when people older than me were young, it it was about the community and the group as much as about the individual getting fit and you know burning off calories mm. and 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 you know getting a getting a better body. Mm. It was it was about the. Uh, the, you know the elders of the club and the mm. uh, the, the ritual, as you say, and um, the uh, the sense of learning from other people who were going to give you a give mm. you a kick up the bum if you did the wrong yeah. thing. That's that's not what happens if you're um, going out and skateboarding uh, or going out and, yeah. and, and um, to the gym. And, and sport is also so much of a spectacle. So it's 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 in a sort of an appreciation of this kind of visual moment, this gladiatorial moment that is in a sense sort of quite isolated and doesn't yeah doesn't have all of that connective tissue. In some way, in some ways, it's actually a result of a very good thing, which is mm. a, um, a a female impact on family life, where. Um, uh, you know, I'd be interested to see if, if, if members of the audience have a view on this. But one of the reasons club sport uh, has declined, things like cricket participation, is um, struggling, is that men going into their probably from their 20s into their 30s are no longer spending every Saturday in summer uh, for eight hours out on a cricket field, and then for 
a couple more hours drinking with their with their team, they're actually spending the day with their families and mm. and much more involved with their children. And so people, men, men are flooding out of of team sports. Uh, when they're having children and, and even before that when they're getting um, married or, or in serious uh, relationships and you can't help thinking that's a good thing that, that, that men are spending more time um, alone or, or you know doing things with their kids and with their, with their partners mm. rather than just in their male groups mm. um, but it swings in roundabouts isn't yeah. it that what, what, what's good for the family may um, y- you know also diminish um, a, a community which leads me to something that I, I want to ask you about, and this is the question of fatherhood. And um, one of my um, one of my interests in writing Sweet Old World was to explore the the silence around fatherhood. Really, um, fatherhood has changed radically in the last. Um, let's say, 30 years. I mean, it, just when you consider the fact that men are, are present at the birth of their children. I mean, we accept that now, but that, that is a, a, a radical revolution in, in family life and the way we, we um, view parenting. But um, what I was trying to explore was um, the, the desire of men to be fathers and the sort of inexpressibility of that desire and what happens to that desire when it can't be expressed and the sort of possibilities for that to be sort of misshapen and crippled in some, in some way. Um, this interested me because I started to see it in my own peer group that um, when friends of mine got very drunk, it would suddenly come out that they were un- unhappy about not being fathers or you know they would um, tell me in, in very kind of oblique um, indirect ways about this this um, this desire and I wonder whether Malcolm you feel that there is a sort of a silence as a man about the experience of being a father David the the chief character of sweet old world desperately wants to become a father and that's really really you, mm. you know to fill in a gap there that's that is key to Deborah's book um, and I have two children um, who are now 10 and 8 years old and I felt I felt that that regret I felt that hunger um, that he had and I felt it personally and um, before I had children I, I didn't you know I didn't have that hunger I didn't mm. um, and and we sort of Thought well, you know, maybe maybe now we'll give it a go and yeah. see what happens. It, w- it wasn't a, a drive to procreate. The the drive to procreate came after the procreation, mm. and um, I'm probably not unusual in this regard that it was it was after I had children that I began to love children yeah. and and want more children. I, I remember my um uh, my father-in-law who's Moroccan. And he's a traditional Moroccan man. He might have a different view on these things. But for some reason, we were talking about Rupert Murdoch a few years ago. And he said, if I was Rupert Murdoch, I would have 100 children. <laughs> and um, I said, well, that Well, may- Rupert Murdoch's <laughs> children are doing so well at the moment, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I said, you know, that may make the, uh, the trust uh, inheritance situation a little bit complicated. And he said, I don't care. If, if I didn't have any uh, financial restraints... I would just want to have as many children as, mm. I, as I possibly can, and and it wasn't because he wants to dominate the world with his with his tribe of a hundred a hundred children. Um, he just loves loves children, mm. and, and he has four children, and and he loves having children, and and um, like often um, the when the appetite uh, when the appetite is fed, it, it generates more appetite, yeah. and certainly I, I do a lot of the um, drop-offs and pick-up at school, mm. and and I'm quite involved uh, at my kids' school. I hang out with the other dads and the mums, but but perhaps more significantly with the dads. We just talk about our kids and and um, talk about the problems the kids are having, and uh, we we talk in the way that my mum, when I was young, would have talked with her female um, cohorts. This is the way the world's changed. Yeah. Um, but you know, you you certainly you you step into an alternative world. Mm. Uh, for me, it's an alternative world, which is which is David's world. And, um, you know, it, it's a raw experience, in a sense feeling, gosh, I'm so lucky, mm. but also, oh, 
I wish I'd had a hundred children. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, 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 it sort of started to occur to me that in a way, a sort of a single heterosexual man in the world that we live in now, which is full of um, the possibilities offered by reproductive technologies, that, that this, um, this creature, a single heterosexual man who was once the most powerful human being on earth, is now perhaps one of the most stranded in, in the desire to be a father. Um, a single woman can have a child on her own. Um, uh, two um, men in um, a homosexual relationship can have a child through adoption or surrogacy. But a single man, um, yeah, he, if he's very, very rich, he can go to India and buy an Indian woman's womb and send vials of frozen eggs and semen and all the rest of it around the world, but then he's got to have the financial resources to do that and then raise the child on his own. So it, it seemed to me that it was this odd, powerless situation um, for, for a man to be in with this particular longing. And you, I, I understand you um, were originally writing a novel which was mm. very much on, on that point of women. Yeah. Um, there, there were three women, weren't there? One, one was providing the egg, mm. one was providing the, the, the womb for the pregnancy yeah. and the other was going to raise... Yeah, the... yeah. It, it was. The novel, as um, Malcolm said, this novel started out being about um, f female infertility and female longing for, um, for children and the brave new world of science which has leapt so far ahead of our kind of moral and ethical considerations about human life it seems to me and um, but I became really bored and frustrated with writing about this because I knew I knew what women want I mean, a, a, as we've said we've been talking about what women want for the last three or four or five decades and I couldn't work out what the men behind these women wanted um, and um, I, the, the silence really started to bother me and I felt like m my obligation as a novelist was to go to the, the quiet part of the story rather than the already written part of the story. So I started to, um, my investigations, my imaginations started to go in that direction. Mm. Before, before sugarcoating too much the question of fatherhood, I remember when um, my first child was born, I've got an older brother and he, he had two sons already who were I think about six or seven years old at the time and I remember when we had this you know, couple of weeks old baby, my brother was walking past and one of his sons was doing something and he yelled out, ah oh, you maggot, can you pick, pick up your underpants when you've walked out of them and, and I said to him, how can you call your child a maggot? <laughs> look, look at this little baby. You know, this child will never be a maggot. <laughs> sure enough, six years later. <laughs> um, we've got, uh, I've got plenty more questions to ask you, but we also don't want to get in the way of, of your questions. There yep. is a microphone in the centre, so if anybody thinks of something to ask, they can move towards the microphone and, and, yep. and, and we can see you. Um, So the question is to Deborah. Um, I think to both of us, perhaps. Um, yeah. Um, yeah uh, the question of young men: of, mm. of have you have you met young men? Uh, the, the whole idea of metrosexuality among mm. among young men, and has that um, impacted your writing? Um, I taught at a university um, until quite recently. I taught for 15 years, and I. It, so it meant that I, I met literally thousands of young men and they all seem to have benefited enormously from the um, freedoms that had um, started to open up to their mothers. That was really apparent to me. And I thought that they were... Um, if I would, was forced to make generalisations, I thought that they were... Um, the most inspiring bunch of, of um, people imaginable. They were, they were gentle and open and curious inquire, and inquiring and full of self-doubt, which is a very, I, it's kind of a, I think it's a nice position to start from as a, a young person. Um, it's kind of, um, it's, it's better than feeling like you know it all. Um, but um, I 
I think that, that, that there is a sort of change. I think there is a sort of fear and anxiety in, um, in youth culture, which is, ju is really quite fast and it's, it's coming up very, it's, it's, it's sort of a wave. Um, I mean, the question of violence and masculinity is also um, something um, that we both touch on in, in our books. But I think as women, it's probably impossible to know the, the sort of potential threat of violence that, that men seem to inhabit much more than we do. Yeah, I mean, we're vulnerable to sort of sexual violence and certainly domestic violence, but it's a different, there's a sort of bristling, bristling nature of, of violence between men and sort of codes that men seem to have to adopt to be with one another that, um, that, we, that we haven't had to sort of um, live with. There's almost, in, in Sweet Old World, it, it, it's an ultimate, a sense of ultimate threat, isn't it? And, and it comes up a couple of times that um, deep down in, in her animal self, uh, a woman's greatest fear is that a man might kill her mm. and, and a man doesn't carry that same... Uh, base fear uh, uh, in relation to a woman. Reading that as, as a male, I found that very confronting and quite upsetting um, uh, because you know you, you don't want to you don't want to feel threatening and you want to, as you say, um, undergo any number of um, uh, codified behaviours to mm. to to avert that threat and to put that threat down. Um, but to learn that in some way. It, it's, it's there and it can never be avoided mm. and it must always be negotiated is, is a very upsetting thing. Well, well this comes from um, a, a very pithy thing that Margaret Atwood wrote many, many years ago, um, which um, a great many women know, as they do many of Margaret Atwood's aphorisms. But Margaret Atwood wrote... Um, men are afraid of women laughing at them and women are afraid of men killing them. And I think there's just, there is so much condensed truth in that and so much falsehood as well. Mm. But, it, but it is an interesting uh, sort of, it, it does show you the kinds of tensions involved and the fact that being laughed at might feel as catastrophic as being killed. Mm. <laughs> I have a question for Malcolm. Um, as an ex-surfy chick, I've perhaps always had a voyeuristic interest in manhood and surfing, and uh, I love reading about it, and I loved your book. But there was one thing that, for me, undercut everything else that the book was about, and that was the fact that Dennis has this uh, unnamed illness or personality disorder, I think, and this seems to me to be part of a perhaps a wider trend nowadays that geniuses, people who achieve, high achievers, are often um, described in terms of their illness. And I wondered if perhaps you could say a bit more about why Dennis has this illness um, and to what extent that's part of his achievement in your book. Um, it's a good question because in an earlier draft of the book the, it, it was named, the, the illness was named, but... Um, I felt I felt very um, emotional about the effect of that because to, to name it, you know, limited him and mm. defined him, as you say. Uh, and you know, I think we 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 all know by now that uh, what is called many things that are called mental illness are um, what promote great achievement or um, uh, you know any number of good comes out of, of humanity from things that could just as easily be uh, diagnosed as illness. I suppose medically they talk about impairment of executive function and <laughs> y you know so Einstein, Einstein had pretty severe uh, Asperger's syndrome and possibly autism but because he was able to work in, in that little niche that he found uh, he was one of the greatest geniuses known to, to, to humanity and um, and, and that happens throughout our world. You know, there are, there are lots of people with undiagnosed illnesses who have been given a niche so that their executive function is not impaired. Um, 
in, in the case of that character, I suppose we've reached a point where he, he's definitely impaired um, and uh, he, he, because he's talking about the past from the perspective of the present, you, you, I suppose what I'm trying to do is bring together the, the genius he displayed and the competitive genius and the, the uh, physical genius that he had and you know, saying, well, that's just another element of the illness that he has. But um, you know, I, I agree with what I think you're saying, which is that, which is that labels, labels don't help. And I, I think one of the saddest things over the last couple of years is how um, you will hear people say that masculinity is just a, a step on the autism spectrum. And I just think we're all d degraded by kind of thinking in those terms. But it's also the way in which masculinity and femininity in recent years have become biological things again. I mean, certainly when I was a young woman, we were all talking about how we were socialised to be women and socialised to be men. And with the sort of development of um, genetic science, um, we seem to have forgotten that um, we've forgotten that element of socialisation and I wonder, both Malcolm and I are writing about men in early to middle late age and I wonder, Malcolm, what you think about middle age and masculinity and whether the socialisation of masculinity starts to break down at a certain age? Um, it, it, it probably probably does, but I, I'm not I'm not too sure because the um, the feelings that older men have for young men, particularly um, teenage men, and this goes back to to um, the question that was asked earlier. Mm. Um, while while the pressure and and the um, the consciousness of what socialisation is may uh, ease um, in, in middle age and later life, you're also um, confronted with, with feelings, and, and this is very much part of David, mm. your character as well, about your own past that you begin to see in younger men. And, and I, I know that sometimes I, I have um, quite violent negative feelings towards younger men and it's a it's a very complex thing and and I'm thinking particularly in the in the surf you know I surf a lot and it's full of guys who are much younger than me mm. and um, it's a mixture of uh, you know you're doing all the things I used to hate about myself or you know I, I regret I regret being like that when I was 18 years old and um, and you know you're kind of projecting mm. uh, you, you're also um, feeling maybe a little bit of what, uh, you know, the Margaret Atwood line, which is mm. that the, the balance of power has shifted yeah. and suddenly my disposition towards a, you know, a very fit and healthy 18-year-old mm. or 20-year-old is, you know, has an undercurrent of fear because now he can kill me. Mm. Um, it, it's a really complex um, mm. mix and, and I have a 10-year-old son who's about to enter adolescence. I, I remember... When I was young, my dad's best friend, who was who was a very sporty, very competitive, you know, real man's man kind of bloke. He read Playboy, and he actually had had um, for the interview. He had Playboy. Po he, he had his um, his study at home, wall to wall, um, Playboy centerfold. <laughs> and and we thought this was pretty cool as kids. Um, and then I went through a period of thinking, wow, that was strange. Um, but but this this guy, I was never very close with him because he he always seemed to be at me and to be picking mm. on me and and to have a kind of rivalry going with me and wanting to cut me down to size. Uh, and now that I'm at the age he was then, mm. I can, although I, d I don't think I you know take it to that level. I hope I don't. There's I can feel that that yeah. burning little thing in a, in a man as he gets older. Maybe a little bit of old bull, young bull, but it's also it's also a pastoral thing where mm. where you want to cut them down so that they don't make the mistakes you made. Yeah, yeah. Hi there. Um, this is more of an observation than a question, and it's probably uh, reflective of my own personal upbringing. 
Um, I was probably what was quaintly referred to in maybe the 80s and 90s as a sensitive new age guy, a snag, which is fine in, the tw in your 20s and 30s, but as you reach your 40s and 50s, the single sensitive middle-aged balding guy is suddenly repellent to everyone. <laughs> Oh, surely and not. He's, he's obviously I, talking about I, you, Deborah. <laughs> I, I actually find that women are just as threatened by a, a sensitive, um, a non-guy guy than guys are. I, I can't function within a group of guy guys. I feel more comfortable with women, but they feel somehow threatened by me. That's the impression I get. Um, I've just, I'm a writer as well and I've, really, I've just recently written a poem called Advice to Single Men of a Certain Age. <laughs> and um, unfortunately it's true. I mean, I can't walk past a playground without you know, looking away, I've got to look away when I walk past a playground. You can't approach single women. Mm. Um, yeah, so this is just an observation that as a, a single man gets older, um, there are expectations there and I think women are, are equally to blame in I setting think, up those expectations. I think you're absolutely right. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I think um, women have got a lot invested in keeping men where they are as well. Um, for a start, it means ceding some of the kind of uh, emo uh, sort of um, the power of being the emotional creatures, you know, the, the sensitive ones ourselves, um, and. I have to say, in my experience of things, women are far more judgmental um, than men um, about other men and other women. Um, so I think there are, are really, really coercive um, pressures from women um, about men. Um, I think men, women are deeply distrustful of men. Um, and that that's really corrosive to all of our relations, but um, at the same time, it's quite frightening to to have um, to think of men's vulnerability as well. Um, I cried at work once, and no one spoke to me for weeks. You know, that's the sort of thing that you deal with. <laughs> I, I mean, I just I, I just find that terrible because yeah. you know we. Um, as a nation, we're um, asked to be thinking carefully about male suicide, or suicide generally, but um, suicide is much more common in, um, in, in men, although increasingly in young women as well. Um, and um, certainly depression in men, and I, I don't know how we can think of suicide or depression in men um, without, without taking note of... of just what you've said, that there, um, that there is a shame around the um, expression of, of, of male feeling. Yeah. And it's, it's become so tremendously tricky because of the sort of hysteria around um, sexual abuse and um, paedophilia. And I say hysteria, hysteria not meaning to say that there's not a genuine concern there, but I think that the fact that you can't walk past a playground because you feel that as a single man to look at children playing is somehow indicting you, I think that's a, just a great tragedy for everyone and most particularly the children of the world because it means that they're missing out on, you know. What do you think, Malcolm? Yeah, well, obviously um, uh, everybody everybody loses from that, and I live uh, in a beachside suburb, and um, you're, you're quite aware of, um, you know, there's a fellow in a deer stalker hat um, with his camera out, you, you know, pretending not to be taking photos uh, down at the beach. He, he is uh, viewed with suspicion, um, perhaps rightly, perhaps um, not, and yet there are lots of people who are, lots of, lots of men who are having 
mm. um, really healthy, great relationships with their kids and taking photos and doing all these suspicious activities. And, you know, at Nippers, my kids do Nippers down at their local surf club. And the, the men who, um, uh, you know, might be, there are men and women who are age managers, you know, they'll have their hands on the kids and nobody is self-conscious about yeah. it at all. It would, but it would, it, it would take so little to change yeah. and an and incident would be enough to change that. And, and you, can, you can feel the potential uh, that that whole world could be destroyed by one incident. That's right. I'd um, love to tell you something that happened to me yesterday. I was at Melbourne Airport waiting for the plane to um, come here and I um, fell into conversation with a young man. He would have been in his 30s. He was covered in tattoos and um, he was with a little skinny girl who was clutching a big teddy bear. She would have been about 10, 12 maybe. And he asked me about the time difference in Adelaide and I told him and he said, oh, because, you know, we're on a really big adventure. And I looked at the two of them and I thought, oh, holy shit, what's going, what's the story here? And I said, oh, you, you're with your daughter? And she said, yeah, I'm with my dad. And their big adventure was they were from Perth. Her mother had died a couple of years ago and he said, and... They'd been at home on a Friday night and there wasn't anything on telly. So he said, OK, pack a bag. They drove to the airport, bought a mystery flight, which um, put them in Melbourne. They spent two days going to galleries and walking through parks and going to her first footy game and the aquarium. Then they drove to the airport and said, Adelaide, Hobart, Darwin, Adelaide. So they hopped <laughs> on the plane to Adelaide. They were, um, I told them all about the, the festival, so they were going to do things, they were going to go to the, see the pandas, and then I said, so what's after that? And he said, well, it's time to go back to school after that. And I sat next to them on the plane, and I'm sure I wasn't the only person, because they were so physically affectionate with, with each other all the time, and I know... I wouldn't have been the only person to look at them and think, what's well, the story there, you know, because he was very, very masculine, you know, mm. aggressively, aggressively so. Um, but he was, he was a stunningly creative father and I complimented him on his fatherhood at one point and he said, I wasn't always like this. <laughs> so. Uh, thank you both for your great discussion. Um, I'm a minister and one of the things that strikes me is that the people who come to my door looking for help are invariably young men yeah. and they're displaced young men, they're displaced from families, sometimes only 15 and 16 years old. Um, they're often damaged already by drugs or mental illness and they don't see themselves with much of a future because the future that would have previously been theirs has gone from our society, which is um, the world of physical work yeah. and that side of things. And I wonder if you've um, thought of exploring that side of manhood because I think that's a really big issue in our society and um, our part of the world, um, this lost part for men to play. I think you're absolutely right. Um I don't know whether it's something that I would be up to handling um, in, in my own work, um, but certainly um, I think that I think the need, the, the physicality of men needs to be honoured much more in our culture. And yes, it is sort of disappearing. Um, it is disappearing from um, working lives and from life paths. Um, and yeah, I, I just acknowledge um, the rightness of your observation. Yeah, and I I, I think that um, the 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 lostness of of um, there is no no one quite so outcast as um, a 15 year old who has neither sort of home nor you know path. I was wondering if you could evaluate the relative robustness of male and female identity. It seems to be that um, a masculine identity is much more fragile uh, than a, a woman's 
uh, identity. And we've just, um, you've alluded to that, uh, I guess, with that comment about um, a woman's fear of being killed, and a, but a guy's can be brought down by being laughed at. Um, and I guess we see, especially in marginalised communities where, um, I, I guess in Aboriginal communities where a guy's um, identity has been completely shattered, yet a woman continues to have motherhood and um, a sort of a community role regardless of the circumstances? Well, maybe something that um, answers your question indirectly. Uh, as a journalist, I've, I've done some work on family court um, matters and, and, and family breakdown. And at some point, and this is another of those changes we were talking about before, the um, fundamental um, uh, gravitational pull changed in, in serious family disputes. The pull at an earlier uh, <clears throat> period was about men not fulfilling their obligations uh, to the mm. families they had left behind, and you know whether they were financial obligations or emotional obligations. The you know the the function of the uh, either legal or you know enforcement system was to make these men accountable uh, to the children they ha they had left. It's it's completely reversed mm. nowadays. If you look at the heat. The heat in, in the family law uh, system and, you know, by inference, um, <coughs> broader in, in families that are suffering um, either breakdown or, or extreme stress, the big fights are over men wanting to see more of their children and, and there's been legislative expression of this um, by the federal government putting shared parenting at, at the forefront um, as an ideal to be... Um, to be attained. Um, when you see men's groups, and there are quite well organised men's groups that represent um, fathers, uh, divorced fathers who um, you know, are in family court disputes, 90% of the thrust is we want to see more of our children. We want yeah. to, we want to be more connected. And I know I know often these live under the guise of you know there can be uh, political plays between the, the, the father and the mother, of course, but something, something shifted about 20 years ago, mm. I would say, where um, you, you know, men, men have actually recognised, men, men who have lost their families recognise that um, freedom, freedom doesn't lie in continuing to run, um, freedom lies in going back and increasing your, your connection and your obligation. Mm. Just wonder if uh, either of you have anything, any comment to make about that uh, much maligned or masculine characteristic of machismo. Um, there are times in a woman's life when, to paraphrase May West, she needs a hard man. There are times in a man's life when, uh, in a leadership position for the benefit of the organisation, he has to wield a knife, uh, mm -hmm. do uh, commit an act which at other times would appear sheer bastardry. Those same men can cry at concerts, can uh, arrange flowers, uh, doesn't make them one or other, but have you got a comment on what, what this aspect of, of, of masculine sexuality is about and how it fits with all of the other things we were talking about? Why does it have to be masculine? Uh, you know, it could, the, the hard man sticking the knife in could be a woman. I'm fond easily. of wielding a knife every now and then myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think we're sort of talking about um, just widening the spectrum for men. Um, I'm not saying that it's still not a narrow path for women sometimes, but my God, it's opened up. Um, but um, for men, um, the, the fact that we can name these few choices that they have means that there aren't enough choices. And certainly, um, um, certainly I'd like men to be able to um, know their power and know their forcefulness and, and know other sides of themselves as well, and that to be kind of allowed by the rest of the world. Without, uh, you know, politics can always be a conversation stopper. But you know, what you talk about the the hard man um, who who needs to go up there and and do the dirty work. Um, you know, very often in in the case of Julia Gillard, that's what a lot of people don't like about her, um, mm. which is that she does, you know, she does things that you. 
expect that's fine if a man does these things but oh if a woman does it there's something wrong with it or the fact that she doesn't have children there's something there's something wrong with that mm. i um you, you know i i get really angry when when i see um the the prime minister of the company being denigrated because she's a woman because she's acting strongly and and, and this being some kind of identity um shaker i i also kind of get a bit um weirded out by um, Tim Matheson and that men's shed stuff. I don't know what that's about. It makes me, makes me kind of give the me that heebie-jeebies. You don't get what the men's shed's about? <coughs> well, I, I get what it's about, but it seems a bit extreme. No, no, I think the men's sheds are splendid ideas, but we'll... <laughs> but I, I don't hear people, I don't hear, um, y you know, the the typecasting coming on to him as much as I hear it coming on to her. No, no, you know, no, of course not. She, she cop cops the brunt of, um, of, of the widening of the spectrum, as, yeah. as you call it, for yeah. a female to be able to act, um, you know, as a leader. Yeah. Oh, our Twitter. Does Twitter have oh, any yeah. any tweets for us? No tweets. There are there are just so many um, in Deborah's book. There are so many um, great little moments and lines. And there's one I want to ask you about, which is a memory David has of his father when when he's a little kid. Yeah. And um, I'll read the the passage. It's beautiful. And he's sitting with his dad, and there are there are ants. They're sitting on the grass, and there are ants carrying off um, off his dad's toenails. Um, his toenails have been cut. His by toenails. The way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and this is David. David thinking it was hard even for him, who wasn't an ant, to move his truck across the uneven slabs and the bumpy buffalo grass. This is his Tonka truck, without its wheels getting stuck or the cars falling off. He bit off some of his own fingernails so that the ants would come back, but they never did. His father's toenails were yellow and hard, but there had to be something special about them that the ants liked. Something to do with cigarettes and hairiness and silence. Something to do with being a man. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very beautiful, poetic um, encapsulation of the mystery of manhood to a young boy. Well, and, and I think the subject of um, masculinity and silence is also um, what we've been talking uh, about today. I think that it's, um, the silence is sort of within every man, but also the social silences um, surrounding men. And I guess that's what you try to do as a novelist, is just kind of bust into some of that silence in some way. Maybe we should capitalise on a moment of silence to uh, leave you. Um, uh, well, would you please thank Deborah? And Malcolm. <laughs> and me. <laughs> thank thank you, you for being such a lovely audience.